Our first presenter, Dr. Dwight Lawson, is Senior Vice President of Collections, Education, and Conservation. Dr. Lawson has been at Zoo Atlanta for 10 years and during his zoological career has built an impressive background in field research with a specialty in turtles. Also with us tonight is Dr. Rebecca Snyder, Curator of Mammals. Dr. Snyder's behavioral studies on giant pandas, particularly research on maternal and reproductive behavior, have made important contributions to a global body of knowledge in the zoological community. While she's best known for her work with giant pandas, she also has a significant expertise in big cats and other carnivores. Joining Dr. Lawson and Dr. Snyder is Stacy Grayson, Director of Education. Stacy brings an extensive background in education and wildlife ecology to her mission to form lasting connections between people and animals in the non-traditional classroom that is the zoo. Her experience as an educator includes time teaching in the Academy for Conservation Training in China. Please enjoy your evening. Um, what I'd like to do this evening is just start off and tell you a little bit about kind of the genesis for this project. This is really kind of the, uh, it is the biggest uh, exhibit that we've done in a little while here, and it certainly didn't start out that way. Um, kind of had a, uh, an interesting evolution. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that before I hand it over to Stacy Grayson uh, to talk about how we deal with education messaging and especially in, uh, in this case where we're dealing with uh, really a, a negative, a hard topic to get across to a lot of the, uh, the public that's coming in. Um, she can talk a little bit about how the, the process that goes into that and some of the design and other things uh, to get that message across. And then uh, Rebecca will come in and tell you about uh, some of the fun stuff that I think you probably want to hear, so we'll hold you to the end. And she'll talk about bears and tigers and about uh, what Zoo Atlanta is doing to uh, help preserve those guys in the wild, as well as some of the challenges that they pose in, uh, uh, in an uh, exhibit setting here at the zoo. Uh, but before I turn it over to, uh, to those impressive ladies, I'm also going to tell you a little bit about turtles because I've got you here as a captive audience. Um, so, let's see. You told me this would work, Adam. There we go. Uh, so how do we get to this, this exhibit? Um, and really what it is is a, a renovation of the Tiger Night Building that kind of went amok on us pretty much. Um, a couple years ago, the city of Atlanta was kind enough to uh, issue a bond to do some capital construction here at the zoo, and we had allocated uh, some money to renovate the Tiger Night Building, where the tigers go and uh, every night spend the night there or there for inclement weather and things like that. Um, this was a, a building, I call it a building, but that's, that's being gracious, really. Uh, it was a structure that was built uh, back in the, in the late 80s as part of the initial privatization of the zoo. Uh, and we've had Sumatran tigers in there for many years. We've had a little bit of breeding success, but not a lot. And given the status of Sumatran tigers in the wild and tigers in general, we really wanted to bump up our breeding program and we needed to do something about that facility. So we're gonna renovate that night holding building. And then something that never happens in the zoo world, um, certainly doesn't happen in, in, in my private finances either, but we had a windfall and we got a lot of extra money to throw at this particular project. And so we wanted to do something, not just renovate a behind the scenes area of the zoo that, that nobody that came here would ever really get to see, uh, but do something, add some exhibitry to this, uh, really make a statement around tigers and some other animals. And so we got the team to work rather late in the whole process, but basically looking at what we could do exhibit wise um, to the tiger area um, and, and add a few things to it, punch it up and, and tell a story. And what we came up with, um, those of you that were familiar with the old tiger exhibit, the exhibit that you saw tonight is basically that same footprint. We haven't used any additional space, uh, but we re reclaimed a lot of land that was originally off exhibit, uh, decided to add sun bear. Originally, we we're looking at sun bear, or Asiatic black bear, or something like that, uh, then pepper a few other exhibits around. <clears throat> so um, we, we started brainstorming, adding things. We wanted to put all kinds of exhibits around there, around the front of the Tiger Building and all this other stuff, and kind of realized that there weren't enough animals and species out there in the broader zoo community to allow us to fill all these exhibits. So we kind of focused on the area that you saw this evening where sun bears are and tigers, renovated those exhibits, added a number of, of, of things, and, including sun bears, um, 
and, and were able to kind of develop, focus on that area and come up with a concept that allowed us to do a number of things. And that was um, looking at the, uh, the wildlife trade, the international wildlife trade and wildlife markets, which gave us uh, basically a, a kind of a broad enough umbrella and flexibility that we could exhibit a number of species, anything from birds to turtles to sun bears to tigers, if we wanted to, bugs, goldfish, any of these things, uh, and tell, um, let's say, a compelling, very problematic story about the trade, the international trade in, in wildlife and wildlife parts and, and things like that. So it's a tough story to tell, and I'll leave that tough part of it to, uh, to Stacy, but that's the, the umbrella where we went with with this to put uh, a lot of these animals into this area. So we were lucky enough to, uh, you know, we had a young pair of tigers, Kavi and Chelsea. Um, when we did the renovation, they went off to the North Carolina Zoo for six months. Uh, we were fortunate enough to get sun bears that you'll hear more about. And then several species that we already had at the zoo, some tortoises, the reed hornbills and all, uh, we were able to put out on exhibit for people to see in this context of, of wildlife trade. So the inspiration for this exhibit, if you can really, if, if, if inspiration is the appropriate word for it, uh, comes from, from some of these images, and these are you know, fairly commonplace. These are wildlife markets in, uh, in southern China. So you can see a little bit of the look and feel. Some of this is domestic animals that are being sold. A lot of it is exotic wildlife that's there. Um, to give you a little bit of the look and feel that the team took and uh, put into the exhibit itself to, to tell the story. This is us down here on the left, and these are you know, wildlife markets in, in China. Um, so that's where all this came from, how we wound up there. And I want to talk a little bit about the wildlife trade, what it is, how it happens, uh, real briefly, so you get a little understanding, a little background on that. Uh, and it may explain a little bit about why uh, some of the species that we uh, are exhibiting are in there. Um, so this is just a, an example uh, of a some of the process, and, and I chose something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, this is uh, some wildlife market imagery from Central Africa where I used to work. And so what happens is you get somebody, oh, the laser pointer doesn't work, but here's a guy that's out doing basically subsistence hunting for, for his family. He'll go out in the woods for a couple of days. In this case, he's in a uh, wildlife sanctuary in Cameroon. Um, uh, he'll go out with a homemade shotgun and he'll basically shoot anything he can find, monkeys, forest antelope, things like that. Most of that he'll use to feed his family. Um, other things he will dry, you know, smoke and dry, uh, and sell to middlemen. Uh, while he's out in the woods, he'll also pick up things that he may not eat, uh, but are commodities that he can sell. You can't really see it, but around his, uh, over his shoulder, he's got a live forest tortoise uh, strapped by its hind legs, kind of like a handbag, uh, that he's picked up while he's out there. And in the uh, shoulder bag that's on his other side, he actually has the smoked and dried remains of about a 12-foot African rock python that he caught while he was out there. So those things he'll take back uh, to the village. Again, some of them he'll, he'll use for his family. Other things he'll hang on to, and somebody, a middleman, will come through periodically and pick up any of these live animals, dried parts, and things like that, and collect them from many, many villages, take them to the nearest town or the nearest city, and basically sell them on to a market who then sells them to, to people that are based in the city. And what happens is as these economies go up and down, cities become more affluent, people can afford more of this stuff, it puts more pressure on, the economy goes down, more people leave the city, they go back to the village and they're doing subsistence hunting and so it's a double whammy on the wildlife. So from the middleman, he's taking this stuff to the markets. Some of it winds up in, uh, in food markets like you see at the top where you're selling uh, animals bits and pieces of them for, for food, either to individuals or to restaurants. Um, other things are for uh, traditional medicine markets. In this case, uh, witch doctors or whatever in, in Africa, but uh, uh, Southeast Asia is famous for traditional Chinese medicines and things like that, so a lot of these pieces and parts wind up uh, in that. And then, uh, particularly in, in Asia, you get uh, animals that are uh, there for pets. Uh, again, as people become more affluent, they can afford uh, pets, uh, turtles, reptiles, birds, you name it, these types of things show up in, uh, in different pet markets. Now, all these pictures aren't true to this guy in Cameroon. I've taken some, some liberties that the turtle being butchered up there is actually from Southeast Asia. The turtles in the middle in the pet market, those are mud turtles from Georgia that are actually in a uh, pet market in uh, the middle of China. So. 
this, <laughs> um, and they've started fishing alligator snappers out of the Yellow River in China as well. This is really an international trade. It's not just some local guy and something happening in another part of the world. Once these things get into commercial markets and into cities, they go everywhere. And uh, Georgia actually passed a law this year that uh, um, bans the commercial harvest of wild turtles from Georgia because these things are being harvested commercially, um, wild animals, wild turtles from Georgia to be sold to farms in southern China to be farmed in China for the food and pet markets in China. And so we're actually exporting tens of thousands of animals from the southeastern U.S. Uh, to, uh, to these markets. So it really is a, uh, a global phenomenon. So that's a little bit about wildlife trade and markets to kind of underlie this. And Stacy and Rebecca are going to go into a lot more detail about that and the particular animals that, um, that, are, uh, um, that we're exhibiting and, and what they um, do. Whoops. But let me go back if I can. But I just wanted to, to, to uh, give a, a quick mention about something that's coming in 2011. I said initially when we had these extra funds, we wanted to do all these different exhibits and had a hard time trying to fill them. So what you see right now is Trader's Alley focused on wildlife trade. Coming in the spring of next year uh, will be complex carnivores, where the front part of the tiger and clouded leopard exhibit, we're going to add a number of new species uh, there and talk about what it means to be a carnivore, what the difference is between being carnivorous and actually being a carnivore. So stay tuned for that because we've got some uh, new and interesting animals coming in uh, in the spring. And we're not going to wait till June when it's blazing hot to do that. We're actually going to open this one uh, probably in, uh, in mid-March or early April. So again, let me talk a little bit about turtles while I can uh, and then turn it over to the, uh, the, the more fun, big, charismatic species. Um, why turtles? Why are they in this exhibit at all? Uh, not just because we're shipping them from Georgia to China to, to sell in markets. Um, it's a, actually a global phenomenon that's happening with these guys. And they're not just boring brown and green pond turtles that you're familiar with from, uh, from your youth. Uh, they're actually pretty unique, uh, beautiful animals in many cases. Um, but the real reason they're in this exhibit is because places that used to look like this just a couple of years ago, three, four, five years ago. This is uh, a radiated tortoise from the uh, southern tip of Madagascar uh, in a protected area there. Uh, increasingly, these rather pristine habitats that harbored these tremendous densities of, of tortoises, more and more, they look like this. Um, they've been absolutely decimated by a number of factors. Removing animals for the pet trade, uh, removing animals for food, um, and removing animals for kind of specialty products. This tortoise has a hole bashed in the top of its shell because its liver was removed to make pate for sale in Japan. Um, so it's probably you know, a 20, 30 year old animal that's been uh, butchered in the field for just that little bit. So it's kind of a uh, you know, sad story when you start talking about that type of thing happening, but the real issue behind it is the scale and the magnitude of this trade. It's not just one little spot of Madagascar or a part in Asia or anything like that. When you start talking about the commercialization and as these, these countries open up and their economy gains steam, a lot of these traditional practices of using wildlife, consuming wildlife, really take on um, a commercial scope and scale that, that's, that's, that's hard to fathom and it decimates wildlife populations. So the top left picture, this is a, uh, a middleman a holding uh, facility in Indonesia where uh, somebody, various people come from uh, the country and, and deposit turtles. They buy them, they hold them, uh, and they, they ship them uh, to the markets in southern China by the ton. Uh, and when this picture was taken a couple of years ago, this particular exporter had uh, standing orders for several tons of turtles per week going into these markets, and that's just one guy. So the scale of this is huge. These are tortoises or turtles being unloaded in crates uh, in this market. This is the famous Guangzhou market in southern China where a lot of wildlife is sold uh, on the right. That's one aisle, one of the turtle aisles. And this market is you know, many, many blocks wide. The turtle section is actually three aisles, each basically a block long that's dedicated to nothing but the sale of, of turtles. So three blocks on either side of that aisle, you'll see stalls like this 
with crates packed to the top, brimming with wild-caught tortoises and turtles from all over Southeast Asia, the US, Africa, and various and sundry other places. So the reason, and you'll see other stalls for other types of wildlife and things like this, the reason it's, it's particularly problematic for turtles and tortoises is that a lot of the things that you take for granted or you think about when you think about a turtle or a tortoise are true. They're long-lived, they grow very slowly, they take a long time to reach sexual maturity, they tend to have very few offspring, not many of those offspring make it, um, and so on and so forth. They are the anti-rat or the anti-roach in terms of life history traits. It's impossible to eliminate rats and roaches, that's why we call them pests. Turtles are the exact opposite thing, and it's very easy to eliminate them when you start pulling big adult animals out of these populations. So that's why these guys in particular are a problem. The lucky ones, if you can call it that, actually wind up in pet markets, so they're not butchered for food, but they may be uh, sold. And as these things become rarer and rarer, you see animals that were once fairly common in the food markets suddenly showing up in the pet trade for exorbitant prices. This is a, uh, something I pulled off a, uh, internet site about two days ago. This is a US site um, for a uh, Burmese star tortoise, one of the animals that's exhibited here at the zoo. Uh, you can see this is one that's actually born in captivity in 2004, um, about seven inches long, and it can be yours for the very low price of only $4,000. Um, if you're a subsistence hunter or farmer somewhere out in the world uh, in Burma, and you have the opportunity and you come across a uh, star tortoise, there is absolutely nothing that will prevent you from picking this thing up and selling it to somebody when the prices that we're talking about are this big. So there's an extreme amount of pressure on these things as they become rarer in these uh, other markets. That being said, don't run back out there and pick up our star tortoise out of that <laughs> out of the exhibit. Um, so the point I wanted to make is, you know, th there are a lot of pressures on these guys. I kind of wanted to reinforce the uh, the uh, the tough time the turtles were, were having. Um, but there is a little bit of hope. The zoo is doing a lot. We've been involved in, in uh, turtle and tortoise conservation for a long time. It's a particular passion of mine. Um, and what, what do we do here? Well, we do a lot of, uh, of breeding, or breeding of turtles. Um, so uh, as, as these populations have been decimated and these species have really gone, become, uh, gotten into trouble, Captive assurance colonies, just having stable populations in zoos and in the private sector uh, is important because the economic forces on these markets are such that you really can't stop that momentum. Um, you, can't, you can't stop people from consuming things on that kind of scale and it disappears so fast that these captive populations are increasingly important. So we're racing to try to get these things established. This is uh, not something that we have on exhibit here. Uh, there are some up in the reptile house. This is a uh, Arakan forest turtle, also from Burma, what's now Myanmar. Um, up in the top right is a couple of those guys in a food market. This species was thought to be extinct for about 100 years. Nobody uh, in Western science or anything had seen them uh, in a century until a handful showed up in the mid-90s in some of the food markets in China, and they kind of backtracked through the trade where they came from and found out that there is a, uh, a population of these guys left in uh, western Myanmar. Um, I'm proud to say that uh, we're the only zoo uh, to have bred these guys in captivity. Uh, we have a number of them. Uh, we also breed radiated tortoises. Uh, we're at the point with breeding success of those guys that we'll probably have to start selling them in the gift shop soon uh, before we get uh, <laughs> covered up. Um, so we do do a lot of that, and zoos collaborate in, in that effort as well uh, to, uh, to make sure that these populations are stable and, and what's, you know, what needs to be breeding and what needs to be slowed down a little bit. Um, and some of these guys, it's not an easy feat. You don't just get these things uh, and they're in great health and you pop them into captivity and put male and female together and away they go. Uh, this is one instance. This is an impressed tortoise that come, came from our partners at the Chengdu Zoo, but it obviously came out of one of the food markets uh, in China. And uh, just like you buy any other food commodity, these guys are sold by weight, just like you'd buy deli meat, pretty much. Uh, and one thing you can do when you're selling an animal by weight, something like a tortoise, uh, if you want to make a little bit more money, you could pack it full of rocks and sand, force feed at that, uh, to increase the weight and uh, get a little bit more money for it. So this one came in, and you can see from that radiograph on the top left, 
that it's pretty severely impacted with gravel. Uh, we tried all sorts of things from both ends of a tortoise uh, to get that stuff out of there uh, without any luck. And so uh, the last result was surgery, which I throw those out because it's a pretty um, involved effort to do surgery on a tortoise. You actually have to turn it upside down, cut through the shell, which is living bone, uh, leave parts connected or whatever, and then go fishing for rocks out of the intestine. Um, so it's a pretty technical surgery that ends up, <laughs> oddly enough, uh, with a children's spoon fishing rocks out of uh, a turtle stomach. So uh, just some of the, the background on, on some of those efforts. And then uh, the other thing we're involved in is the Turtle Survival Alliance. This is a network of zoos, individuals, uh, veterinarians, all kinds of organizations and people uh, that are involved in uh, turtle conservation. Um, my nighttime job is, is vice president of the Turtle Survival Alliance, so I like to give them a plug. Uh, but basically, they identify, help develop conservation projects in the field um, and, uh, and, and generate funding uh, to support those efforts. So these are some of the projects that we've supported. This is a Burmese star tortoise breeding facility in uh, Myanmar. They also do a rescue facility for confiscated animals. This is probably 30 of about 75 giant Burmese brown tortoises that were confiscated on their way out of the country. Uh, and so we, we support a lot of those efforts to, to uh, um, actually have build capacity in, on the ground in the field and, um, and uh, start protection efforts there. So that's all the happy, sad, and otherwise news I'm going to share with you about turtles and things. And I'm going to turn it over to Stacy, and I think we're all going to come back at the end for questions. Is that the plan? All right. Thanks very much. Good evening. How y'all doing? All right. So I haven't bred anything in captivity, so I'm not going to talk about that. Um, but I thought what we could um, talk about briefly is the top 10 things you didn't know about exhibit design. So how many of you have designed an exhibit? <laughs> OK, that's not fair. There's a couple staff in the audience. Um, the first thing I'm going to tell you is there are lots of cooks in the kitchen. Um, takes the curators, absolutely. We have the education manager of public programs. So public programs are the things that you would get with your visitor ticket. Um, docents, volunteers that are out talking to you about some of our animals. Our senior vice president, Dwight. Our copywriter, who couldn't be here tonight, but she is amazing. We could not do anything that we do without her. Her name's Rachel, if you happen to see her. Our creative director, who's very talented. Our director of animal programs, hiding over here. Director of education, that's me. Our graphic designer, everything that you see out on the exhibit went through our graphic designer. She created the templates, well, actually the template you see for this PowerPoint even, that matches the graphics that you see out at the exhibit. Something you didn't know about exhibit design. Our CEO, obviously everything will run by our CEO. And our director of facilities, um, who is responsible for the construction, the actual construction of the animal exhibit areas. So what do you think happens when you put all these people in a room together? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So it's great and it's crazy. Um, everybody's really passionate about what they do. Um, and everybody has a wealth of knowledge uh, um, on their specific area of expertise that they want to convey. So my job, once we get all this information together, is to pull that together in some sort of cohesive plan, which is a good time. OK, something else that's really important, and um, the clip art doesn't re represent anyone in this room. <laughs> Dreams are required, OK? Um, we brainstorm beyond belief. Uh, everything that you can imagine, we, we will brainstorm to kind of get, um, get the energy flowing, and get everybody kind of on the same page, and kind of learn what everybody is expecting out of this um, exhibit. Um, are there any rules with brainstorming? There's no bad ideas. No bad ideas. Everything at this point, anyway, is welcome. So it, that's really important to make clear with everybody who's in the room 
that you know it's it's this is not the time to say oh well that won't work because that happens a lot and that happens anyway even if we tell everybody that there's no bad ideas so a couple of things that we come up with initially are the theme and I'm going to talk about that more in a second what we want people to learn what we want people to experience how we want people to feel and then what positive behavior can come out of this exhibit by our visitors and I say positive behavior we used to say behavior change but the truth of the matter is a lot of us are already doing really um, environmentally friendly and animal friendly behaviors so at this point we now say let's just get positive behaviors okay so exhibits are themes so what do you guys think a theme is maybe how many of you have ever written a story so what what setting maybe subject so your theme is your main message it's what everything that you do goes back to so you may not actually see the theme written anywhere in the exhibit but every element of that exhibit connects back to that theme and the idea behind themes, the research that supports themes, is that people re will remember the general theme, but they most likely won't remember all the facts that you're going to give them. We have a lot of facts to share, but people aren't going to really remember. Them. There might be a few that stick in your head, but, but ultimately, it's the theme that's gonna, that you're going to walk away with. So the theme for Trader's Alley is that animals are sold and traded in markets around the world, especially in Asia, contributing to the decline of individual species and a decrease in species diversity. So that's a mouthful to actually put out on the exhibit. But what we make sure is that every sign, every nook and cranny fits, feeds back toward that theme. OK, and the other thing is we try to do layered messages. So you all walk the exhibit. There's lots of different things to look at, right? So we start with the main message. We have supporting statements, and then we have facts that continue to support that. We also have some kind of off-the-wall things that fit into that. We have crate signs, which I wonder if any of you actually noticed, but we're trying to convey that animals are transported in crates all over the place. Um, so the backdrop for a lot of our graphics looks like a crate. So check that out next time you're out there. We have animal ID signs. Some of the most important information that you're going to get about our animals are on the animal ID signs. So these animal ID signs are in every exhibit with every animal. Um, so that's definitely uh, an important component. And then we have the animal stories. So why do you think we tell a story? Yeah. Remember it. Yeah. So you guys have heard like your grandparents telling stories, and you're going to remember some of those stories forever. So if it's our responsibility to tell some of the stories for the animals. The animals are here as ambassadors for their wild counterparts, right? So it's our responsibility, if we're going to have them here, that we are going to speak for them and tell their stories as best we can. So just to give you an idea, you guys all saw this out there, but the top bold statement, that is the main message for this storefront. So there are three different storefronts. This one is um, at the top of the hill, and it's talking about North America's involvement. And then your animal stories are here on the left, and you'll see these kind of in the same placement at each one of the storefronts. And then on the far side, you'll see the main supporting statement, and then some statistics that we found about animals that are, um, there's one about turtles being exported, and then bear parts, bears and bear parts that are imported. So displays and interactive. So like Dwight mentioned, this is one of the biggest exhibits we've done in a while. And um, there's actually a couple elements missing. Hopefully you didn't notice. But next time you come by, see if you can see anything new. But um, so the first thing is the storefronts. The storefronts are supposed to convey the Asian marketplace. Um, and so we have all these things attached to them and that, um, that you would see in an Asian market. We also have some photographs. So on the bottom corner over there, that's a photograph we actually found um, that shows something that you might see in an Asian market. This was, a, this was actually taken in Asia. Um, 
But I think we talked about, we don't really actually think this is a tiger paw, even though it looks like it. But they can be um, painted and disguised to look like a tiger paw, even if it's not, because that's going to bring in more money for your family. And then on this bottom corner over here is one of the interactives. So the interactives are designed to get you to do something. Um, just, just a little bit more to think about. So um, this one is talking about what is the better choice for wildlife? Each one of them are going to ask you the question, which is the better choice for wildlife? This one's talking about um, a reptile skin boot versus a boot made out of faux reptile skin. So it's obviously not designed for adults. This is designed for our children visitors. Um, but hopefully they can read through this and, and see if they can make the right choice. Okay, and then we have some teaching strategies. So I could go on and on about this, um, but I won't bore you with that. But I will tell you just two things. Um, no gloom and doom before age 10. What do you think I mean by gloom and doom? Yeah, tiger paw is pretty gloomy. Um, what, what, what? Yeah, it's, it's a very sad story. So for age 10, for kids that are under age 10, it's very difficult for them to comprehend some of the things that are happening to these animals. So our challenge with this exhibit is this is a sad story that we have to tell. So how do we tell that story when we know that a plethora of our visitors are under age 10? So what we've tried to do is um, going back to the layering of the messages. So you might not get everything when you walk through the exhibit. Um, and you can, with the little ones, focus more on um, the animals. Let them look at the animals and look at the animals' habitats. Um, the other thing is if you um, infuse too much gloom and doom with kids that are under age 10, they can literally just kind of shut down. And that's opposite of what we want, right? We want to get kids excited. We want to get them engaged. We want them to get them to love animals. I want them to take my job. So what we do is try to be really careful about how we're doing that, knowing that we have a lot of young visitors. The other thing that uh, this helps with gloom and tomb, too, is, is hope. Um, we try to provide a message of hope in everything that we do. Um, this topic is really difficult because a lot of our visitors aren't going to visit Asia or places where they might be able to choose whether to buy a turtle in the market or not. So it, this is a really tough one to provide that message. But as Dwight mentioned, what, what we try to do is say, well, here's what we're doing. Um, you know, that turtle that you saw with the rocks, I mean, that was done right here. We saved that turtle's life, and it's just one turtle, but it's just one turtle. That's, that's the point. It's, we have to do what we can do. Um, you know, it's, the individual makes a difference. So, um, so there, there's always something you can do. What's, what's something else that uh, a nonprofit like the zoo always needs? Okay. So I'll say no more about that. <laughs> David Sobel wrote a book called Beyond Ecophobia, and it talks about how um, kids can't handle some of these really complex messages. The thing, and just again, remember that if you're with kids out there, you just talk to them about how adults everywhere, all around the world, are doing whatever we can to help protect these animals. OK, so hot and interpretation. So first, let me just tell you that interpretation, um, what, what do you guys think it is? In my realm of, of life, what do you think interpretation might mean? OK. So when you think of an interpreter, what's an interpreter? Yeah, basically we speak for the animals. Um, what we try to do is, is use our resources, which are the animals, and try to connect the animals with information that y'all already have. So what we'll do is we'll ask you questions, we'll try to engage you um, to find out what you already know and where you're, you are on the learning scale and add to it what we need you to get from the experience. And it's different for every person. And this is called interpretation in a nutshell. So hot interpretation, what do you think hot interpretation might be? What? That's a good guess. Sorry, Sorry good. Yeah. Why is it called hot? <laughs> okay. Fair enough. 
Um, the, the reason it's called hot is because this is a really tough subject. This is a very sad subject, and it's a controversial subject. We're talking about people and their cultures, and how their culture over thousands of years have, have impacted these animals that we're trying to care for. So it's called hot because it's controversial. Um, the, the main points from hot interpretation are that it engages your emotion and your attention. So did you guys feel emotional at all, either like listening to Dwight or out at the exhibit, reading the stories? And then it challenges your values. What are you supposed to think about this? What are you supposed to do about this situation? And that's what it's designed to do. A couple of things that we, pictures of things that you'd find in the wildlife market. Um, take a look when you go out in the exhibit again and look at the, the, all the little pieces that are attached at the very, um, the, the shanty storefront at the bottom of the hill. Um, there's some handbags that are made out of reptiles. There's um, a couple other places you'll see some jewelry that's made out of reptiles. There's, um, there's a lot of things that um, you have to think about if you're going to go to one of these places or try to explain this to someone else. And this, this bottle on the right is supposed to be something about um, some animal that was, um, and, you know, I don't know if that's vile or what, but we don't, we don't know what it is. And that's kind of part of the, the um, allure of some of the things at the exhibit, too. Take a look and see if you can figure out what some of the things are. It's hard to tell. And, and, um, you use your creativity, you might come up with some things that you might see in our grocery stores. Um, we've got a really cool idea from Julia, who's hanging out over here. Um, so I'm just going to leave that to you, see if you can figure out what it is. But we have to be, get really creative about what we're going to use, because we're not going to go to the Asian markets and buy stuff to fill up a pseudo-Asian market exhibit. So our plan for this exhibit was that the exhibit should encourage you to question, and it should promote personal reflection, and then hopefully enhance understanding of other people's beliefs and viewpoints. Again, it's really hard to talk to other people about their cultures and, and changing that. It's really challenging. OK, so something else that you might not think about when we design an exhibit is evaluation. Um, we do evaluation on virtually every aspect of our business. And we will do that for this exhibit as well. So we're going to let it simmer for a, a little while. And then we've actually got grad students that are going to come from UGA and do um, some testing on the effectiveness of the exhibit, how are the signage um, conveyed to y'all. We need to find out if we met our goals. Did you understand what we were trying to convey? How well is the exhibit perceived? And then what needs to be changed? Evaluation is an ongoing process. You do it at the beginning, at the middle, and the end, and then you keep doing it for the same thing. Because things change, and you have to make sure that you stay current with what's happening. OK. So something else you might not think of is actually coming up with the name for these exhibits. Um, it is a torturous process. Um, hopefully, if you all think of any names for exhibits, you just, just shoot us an email. Again, we have all those people in the room, right? And everybody's got a different word or 50 different words for saying the same thing. And you might come up with something that I like, but then four other people don't like it. So it's really difficult. And actually, the name for this exhibit, Trader's Alley, um, again, we brainstorm, right? All these different names. So brains, uh, traders, or the word trader, came up quite a bit. But we didn't have anything to go with it. And then one of our marketing staff, Lori, I don't know if she's still here, but she came up with Alley, and we put that together. Trader's Alley sounds good. And then Wildlife's Fading Footprints, I actually stole from traffic.org, which is a website that talks about wildlife trafficking. If you guys want to check that out, there's a lot of information on there. Um, one of their researchers did a paper called Wildlife's Fading Footprints about trafficking. And so I contacted them. Can we use the name? Yeah, I mentioned traffic. So you'll see traffic on one of the signs out there, too. So it's really challenging, um, and uh, I don't know what else to say about that. <laughs> and then lastly, my boss actually said this, Dwight said this to me the other day. He's like, yeah, there was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And there literally was. So the things that you, you don't think about what goes into that exhibit, I mean, literally, we were out there. We were all out there with drills and glues. There's a lot of different kinds of glue, if you weren't aware. Um, <laughs> 
and drilling na holes into aluminum is weird and signs that bend is a problem. There's, a, just, there's so many elements that you don't think about. Um, the tortoise exhibit with the um, kind of broken wood front, did you guys see that out there? Yeah, we've actually had visitors climbing into that exhibit already. So it's been a week and they're actually like, like what, what, why would you think you could climb in the exhibit? Um, <laughs> But yeah, they do. And as I mentioned, like those tortoises are worth a lot of money. We've got to protect those tortoises. So what do we do now? Um, at the, the bottom of the hill, the storefront, there's a lot of like um, plexi crate or like boxes. Condensation is the problem. You're going to see that stuff in there soggy, and it's going to be foggy, and you don't even know what's in there. So things that you don't think about. We now have to kind of go back and, you know, we've already got a punch list, uh, uh, you know, two pages long about all the little idiosyncrasies that we didn't see coming. Um, yeah, and things will also break and walk away. Um, we do have everything, as I said, glued or screwed on in some way, shape, or form, but things will walk away. So we're constantly going to be collecting things. If you want to bring anything in that might work at this exhibit, feel free. Um, and then the other thing is, it, it's never finished. Like I said, there's always ongoing evaluation. There's always going to be things we need to replace. There's always going to be new things that we think we're going to add. Um, there's actually about five elements that are pretty important to me that aren't even there yet. So again, come back in a couple of weeks and see if you see anything new. Um, like those interpretives I showed you earlier. There's going to be a really cool um, like fake tree that has a wreath hornbill. Did you guys see the wreath hornbills? Okay, so there's going to be, on the far side, there's going to be a fake tree that you can actually look into this little nest box and see video of our wreath hornbill nesting behavior. They have some of the coolest nesting behavior um, for birds that, um, that exists. And we've got that on video, and it actually happened here. So really cool, look for that. But, and I'll just say, in closing, that again, it's never finished, not only with this exhibit, but also for these animals. These animals are in dire straits. So it is our responsibility, as I mentioned, to, to keep telling their stories and make sure that we can do whatever we can do to keep them out of these markets. So that's it. Anything else? Um, so I get to talk about the two major carnivores that are a part of this exhibit, the sun bears and the tigers, so I feel pretty lucky about that. Um, Wanted to tell you a little bit about these animals in the wild, then a little bit about their status in captivity, and then some specifics about our animals here at Zoo Atlanta, what we have planned for them, what we had to do to build this exhibit for them, how they're reacting to the new exhibit, and that kind of thing. So we'll start with the sun bears, and their situation in the wild, like the tigers, is not great. This map shows you where they're found in the wild, which is in Southeast Asia. Uh, very little is known about sun bears in the wild, actually. They have not been well studied. They're nocturnal. They're solitary. They're not easy to study. And they're not as charismatic, although they are very charismatic, they're not as charismatic as tigers, which get a lot more attention than sun bears do. But we have every reason to believe, so they're listed as at risk or vulnerable. Um, and we have every reason to believe, though, that their populations are in decline because they're exposed to all the same sorts of threats as things like tigers, which I'm going to talk about more in a few minutes. Um, and so we know that their populations are in trouble. Uh, they're in trouble because of some major threats, um, habitat loss, which is a huge problem for a lot of species on this planet. Um, habitat loss is mo mainly because of palm oil plantations in Southeast Asia. So. Um, palm oil is one of the biggest sources of vegetable oil now. There's a huge demand for it, and there's a um, tremendous amount of um, land being cleared to make these plantations. And that's what that picture shows you, is rainforest being um, slashed away, cut and burned, and then these plantations being put on, and nothing can live where these plantations are. Uh, they also, some bears, um, are commercially poached, and I say commercial because, as Dwight and Stacey have been talking about, this is truly a business. I mean, this is, there's huge money to be made, not necessarily for the people in the field doing this, but as all of these things go through the trade, there's a ton of money to be made for sun bears. Uh, it's parts, um, their paws are considered a, de a delicacy in some areas and made into soups and different foods. This is a variety of different Asian bear paws that you see in this display. Their gallbladders are harvested for the bile in them, which is used to make um, some, is used in traditional Asian medicine. 
they, these bears are farmed in horrible, horrific um, bile farms. This picture down here is not a misrepresentation of what happens to these animals, kept in incredibly tiny cages and then um, kept alive for years, but having bile drained through a hole into their, that goes into their body, into their gallbladder, and having this bile drained out of them periodically. Um, and the conditions are, are terrible that these animals live under and still manage to survive somehow. Um, and animals in the wild are, so these animals will live for years in these conditions, but eventually they do, of course, succumb to disease. They die from this um, and from malnourishment and maltreatment. And wild bears are taken out of the wild then to restock these farms as well. So that's a big problem for them too. And some bears are also um, in the pet trade as well in Asia. So the um, cubs are taken in into the pet trade. They may be kept at restaurants or things like that as pets. So there are a lot of threats for these guys. Some bears in captivity, um, they're managed by a species survival plan, uh, which if you came to the lecture uh, in April, they talked a lot about that. And that is a, a way that we manage uh, populations of endangered species here in North America. And so it's done collectively where zoos um, co collaborate to manage the population as a whole. So there is a sun bear SSP. There's a Fairly small population of sun bears in North America, only 42. They are not breeding very well in captivity, um, and we're trying to figure out the reason for that. But there have only been uh, a few births in the last 12 years, and it's only been one um, pair. It was a pair at the San Diego Zoo that's produced four cubs in the last 12 years. So they, um, like I said, are not breeding very well. We were lucky to get the two bears that we have. Um, so. We don't take uh, animals out of the wild. Typically, zoos don't do that. We breed animals so that we have sustainable populations for exhibitry and to teach you about those animals and hopefully inspire you to care about their counterparts in the wild. Um, so when um, some bears are not breeding well in captivity, then we don't have bears to exhibit. And so um, it can be hard to get bears for exhibit. We got ours from the Columbus Zoo. And like I said, we were lucky to um, get them. So the SSP for the last several years has been focusing on Bornean sun bears, which are just sun bears, a subspecies of sun bears that comes from the island of Borneo. Um, as I showed you, sun bears are found throughout Southeast Asia, and the other bears are referred to usually as mainland bears because they come from, um, uh, they might come from Sumatra, which is an island, but they could also come from um, Vietnam, Cambodia, areas like that. And uh, for the last several years, the SSP has not been recommending breeding the mainland bears because their pedigrees were just not very well known. Because the Bornean subspecies has not been breeding very well in captivity in North America, now um, just in the last month or two, the SSP has decided to breed all sun bears in captivity. So breed mainland bears with mainland bears, Bornean bears with Bornean bears, but to breed all of the sun bears that we have to try to increase the population. So our bears happen to be mainland bears, and they just got a breeding recommendation about a month ago. So we're really excited about that. Um, and so hopefully we'll be producing a cub here in the future. So these are our, the bears that we have here at Zoo Atlanta now. Xander is the male, Saba is the female. Xander's 10, Saba is 12. They're a great age. Um, this is around the time that they're reproductively mature at around five, but a lot of some bears don't start to breed in captivity until a little older than that, so they're a perfect age for breeding. They came to us in April from the Columbus Zoo. The Columbus Zoo actually sent them out because they got a breeding pair of Bornean sun bears. And then shortly after they sent them to us, we found out that our sun bears were recommended for breeding. So I emailed the Columbus people and was like, sorry. <laughs> um, we were, we're just lucky to get them. They're happy for us as well. And the really exciting thing about these two is the, they were housed together for a few years at the Columbus Zoo. They never mated there. And they came here. And while they were in quarantine, they actually mated several times. So we're really excited about that because the problem with reproducing sun bears in captivity has been that they're simply not mating. They're not copulating with each other. So it's a great sign that ours mated already. They were on hormone implants for contraception because they didn't have a breeding recommendation. So we don't know if the female would have gotten pregnant from those matings. Um, the bears were immobilized when they came out of as part of their quarantine exam, and the vets looked for their implants to remove those, and they couldn't find them. Those implants dissolve over time, and they would have expired in August, so they may have already dissolved. So we are going to be starting a birth watch on Saba later in the summer, um, just in case she's pregnant. Um, and if she's not, then we hope that, of course, that they'll copulate again and that we might have a cub in the future. 
Um, these two have very distinct personalities, as do all of our animals here at the zoo. Xander is, uh, the way to his heart is definitely through his stomach. He is completely food focused, loves his food, um, and we're using that to our advantage because he's also been the braver one about going out on exhibit and we're um, using food to get him to explore more of the exhibit and spend more time out there. The, the bears have only been going out on their exhibit for about a week now, so they're still getting used to the routine of shifting on and off for our operating hours. And Xander's been the trooper and the one who's been the outgoing one and the brave one and going out more than Saba. And um, we've definitely been using food to encourage him to do that more. Saba is a little bit more shy, um, but she. Uh, She's kind of the boss of the relationship. She, she puts him in his place if she needs to. Um, and she's also starting to adjust to the exhibit now and has been going out more in the last couple of days. So some things about the exhibit. Some bears are the smallest uh, species of bear. There's eight different species of bear. They are small, but they are mighty. <laughs> um, someone described them once as chimpanzees with claws. They are really, really strong for their size. They're very, very smart, and they are very, very destructive. Uh, they have four-inch claws. In the wild, they eat their omnivores. They eat pretty much anything they can find, but they specialize on insects. They're really good at tearing up termite mounds, ant nests, um, digging through that stuff. They like honey. Um, they have those super long tongues to extract insects and honey, and they are just made to demolish things, basically. And so. Um, we have used very sturdy uh, materials to construct their exhibit, like concrete block and steel and glass walls. But they, um, first day out on exhibit, decided that they would work on destroying the building. And they have done a nice job at it. That's what that picture is. The building has stucco on the outside of it, which we were a little concerned might not stand up to them. And boy, were we right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Within about 20 minutes of going on an exhibit, Xander noticed these, you can see these seams in the building and started picking at those. And that's just what some bears do. They find cracks and crevices. They start digging away at it with those really long claws. And they're just, they're curious, they're interested. And he started doing that. And it took him about 20 minutes to tear off sort of the first layer of stucco and get to the layer underneath. So once they find something to pick at, they like to keep picking at it. So um, you may have noticed that this area that he's torn off, so on the building now, those were kind of trim areas around all of the shift doors to come on the exhibit. Our maintenance guys had to remove all of that, so that's not there anymore. And next week, we're actually going to be removing all of the stucco from the outside of the building, <laughs> taking it down to the block wall underneath it and painting that. So it will look similar, but it won't have anything that the bears can keep tearing away at. So um, like Stacy said, with the graphics and things like that, it's all, you know, the animals show us what works and what doesn't work, and it's always a learning experience for us, and sometimes we have to change some things and fix some things up. Um, they're also great climbers and diggers, so the minimum barrier height out there is 10 feet, which is actually um, what's recommended for grizzly bears, which are much, much larger than some bears, but we went ahead and went with that just to be safe. And then there are two feet dig barriers, so buried under the ground where you can't see, those barriers go down two feet to make sure that the bears can't dig out, too. Um, so we have them well contained. And then we have some off exhibit area that you didn't get to see. So in the building, of course, it's where the animals go at night. That's all climate controlled. It's a little bit too nicely air conditioned, I think. They're, they prefer to stay in there sometimes instead of come out in this hot weather. Um, but it is really nice space for them. There's three indoor dens. One of those is what we call an isolation den, which means it has a solid wall. And so that's a nice place to put like a female. If she's going to have a cub, she can then be isolated from the male in that den, and she won't have to see him or anything. Um, so we'll <laughs> which is nice for some bears and, and maybe some of the rest of us. Um, there's, um, there's also a really tall climbing, climbing structure in there that I'm sure you saw. It's a 12-foot tall climbing structure. These guys are quite arboreal in the wild. They do a lot of climbing. They eat a lot of fruit, so they climb um, fruiting trees for that. <laughs> Our bears have not climbed this yet. I think they're still getting used to the exhibit and getting comfortable, so we're hoping, and it's also been pretty hot, um, but we're hoping they're going to start going up there soon. We might use some food to lure them up there too. And they are really curious and really smart, so we have to do a lot of enrichment for them, a lot of toys, a lot of food, a lot of just different simulation for them to keep them busy and, and interested. 
Moving on to the tigers, uh, so there are nine subspecies of tigers, and I'm going to talk a little bit about tigers in general, and then about Sumatran tigers, which are the subspecies we have here at Zoo Atlanta. So tigers come also primarily from Southeast Asia. They used to range through a lot more of, um, of Asia and Russia, um, but, and there are still Amur or Siberian tigers in a small part of Russia. Most of the subspecies, though, are located in Asia. Uh, there are estimated to be about 3,000 to 5,000 tigers total left in the wild, which is really, really, really small number if you look at the huge amount of area that these animals were once found. It's really frightening for tigers. Sumatran tigers, of course, come from the island of Sumatra. They are um, critically endangered. There are only 400 to 500 Sumatran tigers left in the wild, which is a, a sad state of affairs. Tigers are solitary. They are um, predators. They, they need large areas. They don't live in high densities at all. They live in very low densities. Uh, females, of course, the size of their territory depends on distribution of resources, so how much prey species essentially are available for them. So there's a lot of variation in range of tigers. Tigers living in Russia would have huge, huge home ranges just because tiger, the prey density is a lot smaller there. Tigers living in some parts of Asia might have smaller home ranges, but in general, even a, fem a female's home range is usually minimally at least 10 square, 10 square miles. Um, that's one female tiger. Females have almost no overlapping um, territories. They're, they're very exclusive. They don't tolerate another female in their territory. And then a male's territory is usually about five times the size of a female's, and a male's territory will overlap that of several females, and those, are the, those females normally breed with that resident male. He breeds with those females. Young tigers need somewhere to go. They disperse from their mother. They have to establish a territory of their own and they need space to do that. And so tigers are one of those animals that takes up a lot of space and is never going to live in very high densities. So they need, they need a lot of room, and they don't have much of it left. So threats for them, number one, of course, habitat loss. Same thing for them, palm oil plantations are a huge problem. Also acacia plantations, which is what this picture is down in this corner. So that's another um, thing that's been done, being done to forests in Asia where it's being cut for palm oil plantations for the production of palm oil, a vegetable oil that's used in all kinds of foods, and then uh, and cosmetics and things like that. And then acacia plantations, acacia tree is a very fast growing tree, and so those plantations are put in essentially to provide, um, you know, wood for building things, for pulp, for paper, for anything that we use wood for, acacia is being put in. And you might think, well, acacia, it's a tree, it's, it's a, a forest, right? Maybe that's not so bad, animals, it's forest. These animals live in forests, they can live there. But this is a forest that's a field. It's a field of trees, it's agriculture, it's treated like fields of corn and soybeans and things like that in this country. There's roads all the way through it, there's people managing it. Um, it's one type of tree. There's no, no other plants growing there. It's not what these animals are made to live in. It doesn't support the kind of life that a rainforest, which is shown in this picture, would support. Um, it's not suitable habitat for those animals. Not to mention, before the forest is grown, it's this down in the picture. It's clear cut. Then those trees are put in, and then that's all it is, is a field of trees. Tigers um, also are um, subject to human-tiger conflict. Um, these are very dangerous predators. They um, will prey on people's livestock. These animals, especially young tigers that are trying to establish a territory of their own, there's often no place for them to go. They can't, they're not tolerated by resident tigers in the area. They have to find some place where they can live and hunt. That often pushes them to the fringe of the habitat, and then quickly they're where people live, and there's human conflict tiger conflict. So they prey on people's livestock, pets, people sometimes. Um, and so, of course, tigers are killed for that reason. They're also um, suggested, subjected to terrible commercial poaching, much worse than the bears that I mentioned. Again, it's a business. That's why I say it's commercial poaching. They are harvested in huge numbers for their bone, especially, and that's used in traditional medicines. Also for their penis, which is used for, as an aphrodisiac. Uh, I studied tiger reproduction as part of my master's thesis, and I can tell you that you do not want to breed like a tiger. <laughs> they, they, they breed sometimes 100 times a day, 
which might sound great to some people, but I can tell you, even the tigers start to get tired of it after a while. Um, they're induced ovulators, so they require that kind of copulatory stimulation for the female to, to ovulate, but um, copulations usually last a few, maybe 30 seconds would be a long copulation. Um, and the male actually has spines on his penis, um, which are painful to the female, and that's part of what induces her to ovulate. And so this is not really, uh, I think, a, a reproductive strategy that humans want to adopt. Um, and Wildlife Conservation Society did a great ad a few years ago talking about all these facts about how tigers breed and why would you want to use this kind of animal as an aphrodisiac, because it's definitely quantity over quality of matings, I would say. Um, and uh, so commercial poaching of tigers is a huge problem throughout all of the areas that tigers live. Just in Sumatra, they reported that 51 tigers, at least, recorded were killed per year for five years. And now there's only 400 left. So, you know, it doesn't take long for there to be none left when that's going on. Uh, luckily, I can give you some good news, which is that Zooland is actually doing something to try to help Sumatran tigers in the wild. Uh, we have a conservation endowment fund, thanks to the Reader Foundation, and we use that fund to support lots of different field projects on animals in the wild, and tigers are one of them. So we're supporting a project in Aceh, the Aceh forests of Sumatra. This is the, one of the largest continuous, um, like whole tiger habitats left in all of Asia. Unfortunately, a portion of it's been earmarked for road construction. Um, it has not been well surveyed, so this project is doing tiger detection surveys and trying to provide data to the local government um, to show them that there are tigers, that this is valuable habitat so that they can prevent the road from being built that would basically bisect this large area of tiger habitat. Some bears live there as well, as, as well as all kinds of um, other species that are vulnerable or endangered. Um, so tiger detection, tigers are not easy to go out and count in the wild. Um, you can imagine they, they're solitary, they're often active at night. They live in these, you know, one tiger per these huge areas. So um, usually the way that they're monitored is through camera traps. So cameras are set up in these areas um, according to a grid. It's done very systematically. Uh, and then there are light beams that are across the forest floor, and as an animal walks through that light beam, it triggers the camera to go off. And so they're able to sense as tigers in this way, but also anything else that breaks that light beam. So it actually gets lots of data on lots of different species.